Hello and welcome to Tech Deals Hyper Threading for Games Part 2 Follow Up Video. I recently published a video, Is Hyper Threading Good for Games? I will link that in the video description below. And in that video, we tested a Ryzen 3 1300X versus a Ryzen 5. 1500X, both four core CPUs, but the 1500X has eight threads. Not technically hyper-threading, since that's an Intel trademark term, it's technically SMT, but who cares? We all understand what hyper-threading is. Good game, Intel, for making a generic term trademarked. In any case, in this video, we now have the best of the best. We're fixing two things and addressing two complaints of the previous video, and we're testing four popular games, okay, two really popular games and two sort of popular games in live gameplay, not built-in benchmarks, and this time we're switching from middle-of-the-road CPUs to the best that have ever been made, at least in this category, the i5-7600K and the i7-7700K. In this case, I have them running at 4.5 gigahertz fixed on all the cores and threads to make them exactly equal. All the rest of the configuration is the same, including the new video card. Previously, we used a AMD RX 5700 XT, which as I showed you in that video, had problems. I hate to say it, but it's not fixed. The 5700 XT is still uneven in its performance. At 1440p and a 4K, it's not as big a deal, but at 1080p, it's still has some issues, which five months post-launch, come on, AMD, you guys make awesome CPUs. What's going on with the drivers of your video cards? That's neither here nor there. This time we're using a middle-of-the-road RTX 2070 Super. I realize that's more premium than middle-of-the-road, but at least it's fast enough that it's not going to create a bottleneck for at least for what we're doing here. It's a more typical graphics card choice for a lot of people, especially if you're using Intel CPUs and you're at a higher clock speed, then this makes more sense. It's still not an RTX 2080 Ti, but I don't actually think very many people are buying $1,200 video cards. Okay, if you're building a $3,000 premium machine, you are, but that is such the top 1% of the market. I'm trying to test what I think most of you might actually consider buying, and I think a $500 video card is much more reasonable, especially if you're looking at 4-core, four 4-thread four versus 4-core, 8-thread, because if you have a thousand-plus-dollar video card budget, the conversation's over. You're buying an i9-9900K or maybe a Ryzen 9 3900X. At least you should be. If you put your RTX 2080 Ti on a seventh generation KB Lake chip, stop that. You're doing it wrong. In any case, we have Fortnite, Overwatch, Division 2, and everybody's favorite Ghost Recon Breakpoint. And this time, I'm going to show you something cool. I've mentioned it before. I talked about it in the previous video, but I didn't show it to you. And several people said, Why didn't you show it? Because I didn't think of it. I'm going to show you the freezing. What happens when the system becomes overwhelmed due to a lack of threads and how it does and does not show up in the benchmark chart. So that's actually coming uh, later in the video at the end of the benchmarks. I could sit here and talk about hyperthreading till I'm blue in the face, but if you want an explanation of hyperthreading, go watch the first video. Link down below. The first five or seven minutes or so of that video is a detailed discussion of hyperthreading. I've talked long enough. Let's get directly to the benchmark, shall we? Our first benchmark is Fortnite. On the left-hand side, we have the i5-7600K, and on the right-hand side, we have the i7-7700K. Look at the CPU usage between these two. The 7600K with four cores and four threads is basically 100% utilized. It does come off it a little bit. You can see here it's at 87 or 89, but when we're in combat, it's effectively being used 100%. The 7700K you can see is in combat on the right-hand side, and you'll notice that it's going above 50% quite often. There's 60% right there. So we're using all four cores and we're using some of the hyper-threading. Please keep in mind that this is a completely clean test machine with an absolutely fresh install of Windows 10. Nothing is running in the background whatsoever. All we have is the Epic Game Launcher, 
we have Fortnite, and then we've got MSI Afterburner actually running the numbers up on the screen. This is being recorded on an external computer using a hardware capture card, so this machine doesn't even know it's being recorded. You can absolutely play Fortnite on a four-thread machine. It does suffer from some stutters and slowdowns. There are some places where the game just freezes momentarily, not for very long, but long enough to destroy the 0.1% lows, but it is very playable. It's just not perfect. 230 frames per second average on the i5, 204 average on the i7. Whoa, wait a second, you say? Something's broken. No, this is live gameplay. And in live gameplay, the actual combat and the situation and the places on the map are all going to be different. And so performance is going to be different depending upon where you go. I didn't run a replay. I actually sat down and played the game. It was completely controllable and completely smooth, except for a couple of places where the game just hitched and froze a couple of times, which is why if you look at the 0.1% low, the one is accurate. It did freeze a couple of places. The 1% low is also accurate, 93 versus 108, 99% of the time, Basically, performance is great on either CPU. It's just that the particular combat I was in simply favored the i5's battle in this particular case. Overall, it worked very well regardless. Moving right along to Overwatch. Overwatch has been out for a couple of years now, and it is designed, like Fortnite, to run on a wide variety of computers, both very basic as well as high-end. Now here you can see that the i5-7600K is again being fully utilized, the percentage. It just hit 100%, 98, 96, back to 98 again. We are using all four cores completely. We're not doing anything in the background. If you were trying to watch a video, listen to music, if you had a Chrome web browser open, a second monitor, if you were trying to live stream, the i5-7600K would fall apart and you'd get a lot of hitching here if you were doing anything at all with your computer. I cannot overemphasize the point that this is a brand new fresh install of Windows with everything disabled and turned off to provide a perfect test bench. One of the comments that some people have said in the past is, well, why don't you try to simulate the average user? Open Chrome, have a YouTube video playing, or have a Twitch stream playing, have a bunch of stuff going on, load up the task tray with, you know, eight things. I understand the idea there. I, I get the concept. The problem is, how far do you take it? Uh, medium, high, what's your definition of high? If I say typical user case, well, what's a typical user? That could be all kinds of different things. It's also not necessarily repeatable because I might have programs that are running in the background that might be auto-updating one run and not auto-updating another. I might have a, you know, Chrome might be checking for updates or doing a refresh or, uh, you know, various extensions might be doing something in the background in one run but not another. And so it's very easy to say try to simulate a typical user environment, but even if you load up the same stuff each time, they'll be doing different things in different tasks since you end up with an uneven workload. Now, it's true that you could repeat the tests five times or six times or ten times, and over the course of several hours of testing and updating and rebooting, yes, you would average those differences out. Unfortunately, I don't have two full-time employees working for me yet, you know, benchmarking, which is what it would take to do what I just described. So it's a nice idea, but yeah. In any case... Uh, the i7-7700K you can see is going above 50%, and frankly, it's highly recommended, even for games like this, but it is very, very smooth, even on an i5. 224 versus 220 average, 153 versus 161, and 118 versus 110. In terms of a perfect, clean benchmark test bench with nothing else going on, it doesn't matter. I've already discussed where it might matter, so we won't rehash that. But wow, talk about epic performance. Moving on to the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, we have Ghost Recon Breakpoint. The follow-up sequel to Ghost Recon Wildlands, and it is a sequel, it takes place in the same universe and even references Wildlands. This game will use eight cores. I didn't say eight threads, I said eight cores. If you have an 8-core, 16-thread CPU, it'll go over 50% CPU usage on a, say, Ryzen 7 2700X or an i9-9900K. On an i7-7600K, 
9700K 8 core 8 thread CPU, yep, it'll peg it out to 100%. Which is one reason why, if you like to play the latest AAA games, buying an i7 9700K with 8 cores and 8 threads strikes me as kind of a foolish investment because it's already maxed. It's at 100% and it's got nothing left in today's games right now. Where's your future? There's no future in that. So that's why I say an 8-core 16-thread is the new minimum for a new purchase for a serious gaming PC that wants to be able to play the new latest greatest games and the, the games coming out soon. Now, as you watch the gameplay on the screen, you'll notice that the i5-7600K appears to be doing just fine. It runs fine. It controls pretty well. The extra clock speed definitely helps. I showed this game when I did the previous hyper-threading comparison where I was doing a Ryzen 3 1300X versus a Ryzen 5 1500X. Both four-core chips, but a 1300X has no hyper-threading. Okay, SMT because AMD, whatever, you guys know what I mean. And then the 1500X does. But those CPUs run at 3.6 gigahertz. These are running at 4.5, and they're Intel chips. Their recent Intel chips, it does make a difference. We probably have somewhere in the 40 to 50% additional performance range in terms of gaming performance, maybe 35 to 40% in terms of uh, Cinebench performance, maybe per se. But in terms of gaming performance, an i7-7700K is much, much better than a Ryzen 5 1500X. More expensive, of course, but it is a much better CPU. We are being helped by the additional clock speed. We are being helped by that Intel optimization, that Intel gaming performance, which is a real thing. Zen 2 is pretty close, but a 1500X is no Zen 2. It's Zen 1, first gen, and so on and so forth. And as you can see here, we're not suffering through horrendous hitching on the i5-7600K, but it's not absent. It doesn't show up in the chart because of the length of the benchmark, but if you look at the real-time numbers on the screen, I'm showing you this section of the benchmark for a reason. The numbers on the top of the screen, the, the white numbers, the left number is the real-time frame rate as what you're watching on the screen right now. The next one over is the uh, frame time. It's how much uh, milliseconds are between each frame. And then the graph beneath I actually have set to be the frame time graph as well. Then the middle white number is the average number. The second from the right is the ongoing real-time 1% low calculated as the benchmark runs. And then the far right number is the real-time calculated 0.1% low. Notice on the i5, it's currently two frames per second. It will not be in the chart you're about to see. And that's because I played for about 20-ish minutes on each of these configurations and eventually the laws of averaging of, of adding up all the numbers the hitches that occurred became beneath that 0.1 percent low and uplifted it which means that it really wasn't that big of a deal it happened but it happened like twice just briefly and so it really wasn't a big deal not nearly as big a deal as it was on the uh, Ryzen 3 1300X, because when I did the original video, I talked about how horrifically bad it was and how badly you needed the hyper-threading. Well, 4.5 gigahertz plus Intel cores makes up for that to some extent. And of course, we have a much better video card this time around as well, which never hurts, because the AMD card was kind of, yeah. 79 frames per second average on the i5 versus 98 on the i7. But the more interesting number is the 1% and 0.1% low. 45 to 73 is a huge difference, and that's legit over 20 minutes of testing. There really is that big of a difference. The drops, the stutters, the slowdown on the i5 is real. It's playable because this is basically the best four core, four thread Intel chip ever made, and it's running at 4.5 gigahertz, which is a nice speed, and that helps tremendously compared to the performance on the Ryzen 3, or if you had something older, like an i5-2400 would be god-awful in this game. It would just be horrible. Old, it just is not cut the mustard anymore. Same thing with the 0.1% low, 32 to 59 is a dramatic difference. It's not as bad as Ryzen because we've gone from a middle of the road chip to the best that ever existed and the best that frankly ever will exist to be completely honest because the world is moving on to six and eight core CPUs. But it just does demonstrate 
that given more clock speed and given a better chip, it does at least alleviate some of the pain of being thread count limited. The Division 2, a frankly better optimized game than Ghost Recon Breakpoint. I've been very impressed at how well this runs on a variety of machines. Here on the screen, I'm doing two side missions. They're in different places, but it's not major campaigns. They're just side missions. So they're fairly comparable in terms of number of enemies and size of the environment that I'm fighting with and whatnot. If you look at the real-time numbers up on the top of the screen, of course the i7 is faster because this game does use more than four threads. But it's not terrible on the i5, at least at this point in the benchmark. I'm going to show you, I'm going to go full screen and show you a different spot here in a second. But most of the time, the i5 is fine. And I suspect this is what happens a lot of times when people say, well, I've got a four core, four thread i5. What are you talking about, Willis? Everything's fine. I get great benchmark numbers. What are you smoking? Well, you do, mostly. And you've learned to live with hitches and slight delays and longer loading times and poor multitasking performance. You've learned to live with that. Look on the right-hand side on the i7. 73%, 78% CPU usage. That is a lot more than four cores, four threads right there. We're using almost all of the threads on the i7, but not all the time. Most of the time, you can get away with not having it. Most of the time, it's okay and not necessary. By the way, uh, we missed it, but if you look back at the left-hand side on the i5, notice that our 1% real-time low is down to 5? Yeah, hitching, woohoo, for the win. It really does happen. It is a thing. It's not game-killing. When you've got 4.5 gigahertz of KB Lake cores, most games will kind of push through it not so badly. On the lower-end chips, an older i5 from second, third, or fourth generation with DDR3, a first-generation Ryzen, they're all going to suffer much, much more. But this is sort of the best-case scenario. And again, this is a completely clean test machine with nothing running on it. I'll again point your attention to the CPU usage on that i7. And once again, I'll remind you... I cannot make this machine any prettier when it comes to the fact that nothing's running in the background. No tasks, nothing in the tray, nothing's installed. It's as clean as a whistle. So take it for what it is, but uh, if you want to play current games and you've got a four-core, four-thread chip, you can get away with it. But not for much longer, not if you want to keep up with the new stuff. We're going to jump ahead here. We've gone full screen with the i5-7600K because I want you to watch something here. This is not paused by me. This is the game, and this happens several times during the benchmarking. This is a freeze. The machine just freezes, and then you can get control of it again. It's not for long, and it's not often enough to make it unplayable. Let me show you that again. Here we are running towards the police car. Our 0.1% low is currently 43 frames per second. Everything's great, right? And freezing and freezing and freezing. And notice that our 0.1% low dropped to 1. Notice the 1% low only dropped to 58. And that's because this is a 20-minute benchmark. And that level of freezing does not destroy a 20-minute benchmark's 1% low. When you're looking at benchmarks, how long it was tested, how it was tested, you cannot just look at a chart and gain everything you need to know. And this is why I do so much live gameplay testing. I do very little replays, occasionally I do. It really does make a difference. Now, what the pause you just saw, if that occurs once every five minutes of gameplay, does it really matter? Well, in the middle of a firefight, it would. By the way, this is pretty epic. An entire group destroyed all in one shot. It doesn't really matter, but it would kind of suck if it happened at, an, at a basically a bad time or if you're doing PvP or something else. So it's tolerable, but I wanted you to see that so you had an idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about like system freezing, which happens just not all that often when you got 4.5 gigahertz of KB Lake cores. 110 frames per second on the i5 versus 122 on the i7, 67 and 93 at the 1% low, and yeah, 1 to 76 on the 0.1% low. This right here is why I continue to see people, and I think a lot of people who have these older machines go, but, but my benchmark's fine, man, what are you talking about? Well, it is, but you've learned to live with that. 
And it's not often, it's not all the time, it's not so much that it destroys your gaming experience, but it does exist. How much it exists depends upon the game, how much you have running in the background, how fresh your Windows install is, what video card you have, what generation CPU you have, what games you're playing. This might not be an issue. Lots of you listening to me are probably fine on a four core, four thread chip. And then others of you listening long ago left it because it was a completely terrible experience. Depends upon what you're doing. In this case, it's playable, at least when you've got the best, but it's time to upgrade. Thank you all so much for watching all of that. Hopefully it was informative and interesting. If you like these kind of follow-up videos, well, you know where the subscribe, the bell notification icon, the like button, and the comment section so those YouTube bots have something to say. Oh, engagement, yum, yum. Links in the video description below. Well, to be completely blunt, the only thing on this desk that any of you should buy is an RTX 2070 Super. And frankly, the 2060 Super is a better deal if you already own them. I mean, if you already have a 7700K, you can still use it. You don't have to replace a 7700K. A 1500X, well, because it's so easy to upgrade, it's probably time to upgrade. And you don't have to upgrade a four core, four thread chip. I mean, as I said during the benchmarks, it, it still does the job for a lot of people. If you're playing Overwatch, who cares? Unless you're super competitive or you're live streaming or recording or doing three other things in your machine and have multiple monitors, I mean, that's a separate conversation. Completely clean test bench with an absolute fresh install of Windows 10 and nothing running on it, so yeah. But if you're buying new, if you're ready to purchase, maybe you have a five-year-old computer, a 10-year-old computer, maybe you don't have a computer and you're just using an Xbox and you're ready to buy, don't buy any of this. I mean, unless it's like, you know, $20. What you should be buying is like a Ryzen 5 2600 at the bare minimum. They're like 110-ish dollars at the moment, and there's no excuse to buy less. I do think the extra money for a Ryzen 7 2700 is worth it. Another $30, $35 or so gets you 25% more cores, uh, gets you eight cores instead of six cores. Well, technically that's 33% more cores. It gets you more cores, more threads. It gets you a better cooler. The 2700 comes with the larger Wraith Spire versus the Wraith Stealth on a 2600. And while yes, it's only a second generation Ryzen, it is better than the first. And it kind of bridges the gap between the first and Intel level performance. And at the prices they're currently at now, I wouldn't buy any four core anything if you're making a purchase today. So there's that. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you love it. Remember to subscribe, bell notification, comment, and everything else down below. I appreciate you guys watching. I'm looking forward to reading your comments in the comment section below as to what you guys think of this follow-up video. I don't do a lot of follow-up videos on this channel, so this is gonna kind of be uh, an interesting experiment. I do appreciate those of you who have taken the time to watch. Two gold stars to anybody who got to this point. Thanks so much, and I will see all of you next time.